Chapter 32 Since its arrival at Lake Chad, the balloon had struck a current that edged it further to the westward. A few clouds tempered the heat of the day, and besides, a little air could be felt over this vast expanse of water. But about one o'clock, the Victoria, having slanted across this part of the lake, again advanced over the land for a space of seven or eight miles. The doctor, who was somewhat vexed at first at this turn of his course, no longer thought of complaining when he caught sight of the city of Kuka, the capital of Borno. He saw it for a moment, encircled by its walls of white clay, and a few rudely constructed mosques rising clumsily above that conglomeration of houses that looked like playing dice, which form most Arab towns. In the courtyards of the private dwellings and on the public squares, grew palms and kachuk trees, topped with a dome of foliage more than 100 feet in breadth. Joe called attention to the fact that these immense parasols were in proper accordance with the intense heat of the sun, and made thereon some pious reflections, which it were needless to repeat. Kuka really consists of two distinct towns, separated by the Dendal, a large boulevard 300 yards wide, at that hour crowded with horsemen and foot passengers. On one side, the rich quarter stands squarely with its airy and lofty houses laid out in regular order. On the other is huddled together the poor quarter, a miserable collection of low hovels of a conical shape, in which a poverty-stricken multitude vegetates rather than live, since Kuka is neither a trading nor a commercial city. Kennedy thought it looked something like Edinburgh, where that city extended on a plain with its two distinct boroughs. But our travelers had scarcely the time to catch even a glimpse of it, for with the fickleness that characterizes the air currents of this region, a contrary wind suddenly swept them some 40 miles over the surface of Lake Chad. Then they were regaled with a new spectacle. They could count the numerous islets of the lake, inhabited by the Bidiomas, a race of bloodthirsty and formidable pirates, who are as greatly feared when neighbors as are the Tuaregs of Sahara. These esteemable people were in readiness to receive the Victoria bravely with stones and arrows, but the balloon quickly passed their islands, fluttering over them from one to the other with butterfly motion, like a gigantic beetle. At this moment, Joe, who was scanning the horizon, said to Kennedy, There, sir, as you are always thinking of good sport, yonder is just the thing for you. What is it, Joe? This time the doctor will not disapprove of your shooting. But what is it? Don't you see that flock of big birds making for us? Birds? exclaimed the doctor, snatching his spyglass. I see them, replied Kennedy. There are at least a dozen of them. Fourteen, exactly, said Joe. Heaven grant that they may be of a kind sufficiently noxious for the doctor to let me peg away at them. I should not object, but I would much rather see those birds at a distance from us. Why are you afraid of those fowls? They are condors, and of the largest size. Should they attack us? Well, if they do, we'll defend ourselves. We have a whole arsenal at our disposal. I don't think those birds are so very formidable. Who can tell, was the doctor's only remark. Ten minutes later, the flock had come within gunshot, and were making the air ring with their hoarse cries. They came right toward the Victoria, more irritated than frightened by her presence. How they scream! What a noise! said Joe. Perhaps they don't like to see anybody poaching in their country up in the air, or daring to fly like themselves. Well, now to tell the truth, when I take a good look at them, they are an ugly, ferocious set and I should think them dangerous enough if they were armed with Purdy Moore rifles, admitted Kennedy. They have no need of such weapons, said Ferguson, looking very grave. The condors flew around them in wide circles, their flight growing gradually closer and closer to the balloon. They swept through the air in rapid, fantastic curves, occasionally precipitating themselves headlong with the speed of a bullet, and then breaking their line of projection by an abrupt and daring angle. The doctor, much disquieted, resolved to ascend so as to escape this dangerous proximity. He therefore dilated the hydrogen in his balloon, and it rapidly rose. 
but the condors mounted with him, apparently determined not to part company. They seem to mean mischief, said the hunter, cocking his rifle. And, in fact, they were swooping nearer, and more than one came within fifty feet of them, as if defying the firearms. By George, I'm itching to let him have it, exclaimed Kennedy. No, Dick, not now. Don't exasperate them needlessly. That would only be exciting them to attack us. But I could soon settle those fellows. You may think so, Dick, but you are wrong. Why? We have a bullet for each of them. And suppose that they were to attack the upper part of the balloon? What would you do? How would you get at them? Just imagine yourself in the presence of a troop of lions on the plain, or a school of sharks in the open ocean. For travelers in the air, this situation is just as dangerous. Are you speaking seriously, Doctor? Very seriously, Dick. Let us wait, then. Wait. Hold yourself in readiness in case of an attack, but do not fire without my orders. The birds then collected at a short distance, yet to near that their naked necks, entirely bare of feathers, could be plainly seen, as they stretched them out with an effort of their cries, while their grisly crests, garnished with a comb and gills of deep violet, stood erect with rage. They were of the very largest size, their bodies being more than three feet in length, and the lower surface of their white wings glittering in the sunlight. They might well have been considered winged sharks, so striking was their resemblance to those ferocious rangers of the deep. They are following us, said the doctor, as he saw them ascending with him. And mount as we may, they can fly still higher. Well, what are we to do? asked Kennedy. The doctor made no answer. Listen, Samuel, said the sportsman. There are fourteen of those birds. We have seventeen shots at our disposal, if we discharge all our weapons. Have we not the means then to destroy them or disperse them? I will give a good account of some of them. I have no doubt of your skill, Dick. I look upon all as dead that may come within range of your rifle, but I repeat that. If they attack the upper part of the balloon, you could not get a sight at them. They would tear the silk covering that sustains us, and we are 3,000 feet up in the air. At this moment, one of the ferocious birds darted right at the balloon, with outstretched beak and claws ready to rend it with either or both. Fire! Fire at once! cried the doctor. He had scarcely ceased ere the huge creature, stricken dead, dropped headlong, turning over and over in space as he fell. Kennedy had already grasped one of the two-barreled fowling pieces, and Joe was taking aim with another. Frightened by the report, the condors drew back for a moment, but they almost instantly returned to the charge with extreme fury. Kennedy severed the head of one from its body with his first shot, and Joe broke the wing of another. Only eleven left, said he. Thereupon, the birds changed their tactics, and by common consent, soared above the balloon. Kennedy glanced at Ferguson. The latter, in spite of his imperturbability, grew pale. Then ensued a moment of terrifying silence. In the next, they heard a harsh tearing noise, as of something rending the silk, and the car seemed to sink from beneath the feet of our three aeronauts. We are lost! exclaimed Ferguson, glancing at the barometer, which was now swiftly rising. Over with the ballast! he shouted. Over with it! And in a few seconds, the last lumps of quartz had disappeared. We are still falling. Empty the water tanks. Do you hear me, Joe? We are pitching into the lake. Joe obeyed. The doctor leaned over and looked out. The lake seemed to come up toward him like a rising tide. Every object around grew rapidly in size while they were looking at it. The car was not 200 feet from the surface of Lake Chad. The provisions! The provisions! cried the doctor. And the box containing them was launched into space. Their descent became less rapid but the luckless aeronauts were still falling and into the lake. Throw out something! Something more! cried the doctor. There's nothing more to throw! was Kennedy's despairing response. Yes, there is! called Joe, and with a wave of the hand he disappeared like a flash over the edge of the car. Joe! Joe! exclaimed the doctor, horror-stricken. The Victoria, thus relieved, resumed her ascending motion, mounting a thousand feet into the air, and the wind, burying itself in the disinflated covering, bore them away toward the northern part of the lake. Lost! exclaimed the sportsman with a gesture of despair. Lost to save us! responded Ferguson. And these men, intrepid as they were, felt the large tears streaming down their cheeks. They leaned over in the vain hope of seeing some trace of their heroic companion, but they were already far away from him. 
What course shall we pursue? asked Kennedy. Alight as soon as possible, Dick, and then wait. After a sweep of some sixty miles, the Victoria halted on a desert shore on the north of the lake. The anchors caught in a low tree, and the sportsmen fastened it securely. Night came, but neither Ferguson nor Kennedy could find one moment's sleep. Chapter 33 On the morrow, the 13th of May, our travelers, for the first time, reconnoitered the part of the coast on which they had landed. It was a sort of island of solid ground in the midst of an immense marsh. Around this fragment of terra firma grew reeds as lofty as trees are in Europe, and stretching away out of sight. These impenetrable swamps gave security to the position of the balloon. It was necessary to watch only the borders of the lake. The vast stretch of water broadened away from the spot, especially toward the east, and nothing could be seen on the horizon, neither mainland nor islands. The two friends had not yet ventured to speak of their recent companion. Kennedy first imparted his conjectures to the doctor. Perhaps Joe is not lost after all, he said. He was a skillful lad and had few equals as a swimmer. He would find no difficulty in swimming across the Firth of Forth at Edinburgh. We shall see him again. But how and where I know not. Let us omit nothing on our part to give him the chance of rejoining us. May God grant it as you say, Dick, replied the doctor with much emotion. We shall do everything in the world to find our lost friend again. Let us in the first place see where we are. But above all things, let us rid the Victoria of this outside covering, which is of no further use. That will relieve us of 650 pounds, a weight not to be despised, and the end is worth the trouble. The doctor and Kennedy went to work at once, but they encountered great difficulty. They had to tear the strong silk away piece by piece, and then cut it in narrow strips so as to extricate it from the meshes of the network. The tear made by the beaks of the condors was found to be several feet in length. This operation took at least four hours. But at length, the inner balloon, once completely extricated, did not appear to have suffered in the least degree. The Victoria was thus diminished in size by one-fifth, and this difference was sufficiently noticeable to excite Kennedy's surprise. "'Will it be large enough?' he asked. "'Have no fears on that score. I will re-establish the equilibrium, and should our poor Joe return, we shall find a way to start off with him again on our old route. At the moment of our fall, unless I am mistaken, we were not far from an island. Yes, I recollect it, said the doctor. But that island, like all the islands on Lake Chad, is no doubt inhabited by a gang of pirates and murderers. They certainly witnessed our misfortune, and should Joe fall into their hands, what will become of him unless protected by their superstitions? Oh, he's just a lad to get safely out of that scrape, I repeat. I have great confidence in his shrewdness and skill. I hope so. Now, Dick... You may go and hunt in the neighborhood, but don't get far away whatever you do. It has become a pressing necessity for us to renew our stock of provisions since we had to sacrifice nearly all the old lot. Very good, Doctor. I shall not be long absent. Hereupon, Kennedy took a double-barreled fowling piece and strode through the long grass toward a thicket not far off, where the frequent sound of shooting soon let the Doctor know that the sportsman was making a good use of his time. Meanwhile, Ferguson was engaged in calculating the relative weight of the articles still left in the car, and in establishing the equipoise of the second balloon. He found that there were still left some 30 pounds of pemmican, a supply of tea and coffee, about a gallon and a half of brandy, and one empty water tank. All the dried meat had disappeared. The doctor was aware that, by the loss of the hydrogen in the first balloon, the ascensional force at his disposal was now reduced to about 900 pounds. He therefore had to count upon this difference in order to rearrange his equilibrium. The new balloon measured 67,000 cubic feet and contained 33,480 feet of gas. The dilating apparatus appeared to be in good condition, and neither the battery nor the spiral had been injured. 
the ascensional force of the new balloon was then about 3,000 pounds, and in adding together the weight of the apparatus, of the passengers, of the stock of water, of the car and its accessories, and putting aboard 50 gallons of water and 100 pounds of fresh meat, the doctor got a total weight of 2,830 pounds. He could then take with him 170 pounds of ballast for unforeseen emergencies, and the balloon would be in exact balance with the surrounding atmosphere. His arrangements were completed accordingly, and he made up for Joe's weight with a surplus of ballast. He spent the whole day in these preparations, and the latter were finished when Kennedy returned. The hunter had been successful and brought back a regular cargo of geese, wild duck, snipe, teal, and plover. He went to work at once to draw and smoke the game. Each piece suspended on a small thin skewer was hung over a fire of green wood. When they seemed to be in good order, Kennedy, who was perfectly at home in the business, packed them away in the car. On the morrow, the hunter was to complete his supplies. Evening surprised our travelers in the midst of this work. Their supper consisted of pemmican, biscuit, and tea. And fatigue, after having given them appetite, brought them sleep. Each of them strained eyes and ears into the gloom during his watch, sometimes fancying that they heard the voice of poor Joe. But alas, the voice that they so longed to hear was far away. At the first streak of day, the doctor aroused Kennedy. I have been long and carefully considering what should be done, said he, to find our companion. Whatever your plan may be, doctor, it will suit me. Speak. Above all things, it is important that Joe should hear us from us in some way. Undoubtedly. Suppose the brave fellow should take it into his head that we have abandoned him? He? He knows us too well for that. Such a thought would never come into his mind. But he must be informed as to where we are. How can that be managed? We shall get into our car and be off again through the air. But should the wind not bear us away? Happily it will not. See, Dick? It is carrying us back to the lake. And this circumstance, which would have been very vexatious yesterday, is fortunate now. Our efforts, then, will be limited to keeping ourselves above that vast sheet of water throughout the day. Joe cannot fail to see us, and his eyes will be constantly on the lookout in that direction. Perhaps he will even manage to let us know the place of his retreat. If he be alone and at liberty, he certainly will. And if a prisoner, resumed the doctor, it would not be in the practice of the natives to confine their captives, he will see us and comprehend the object of our researches. But at last, put in Kennedy, for we must anticipate, should we find no trace, if he should have left no mark to follow him by, what are we to do? We shall endeavor to regain the northern part of the lake, keeping ourselves as much in sight as possible. There we'll wait. We'll explore the banks. We'll search the water's edge, for Joe will assuredly try to reach the shore. And we will not leave the country without having done everything to find him. Let us set out then, said the hunter. The doctor hereupon took the exact bearings of the patch of solid land that they were about to leave, and arrived at the conclusion that it lay on the north shore of Lake Chad, between the village of Lari and the village of Ingamini, both visited by Major Denham. During this time, Kennedy was completing his stock of fresh meat. Although the neighboring marshes showed traces of the rhinoceros, the lamentine, or manatee, and the hippopotamus, he had no opportunity to see a single specimen of those animals. At seven in the morning, but not without great difficulty, which to Joe would have been nothing, the balloon's anchor was detached from its hold, the gas dilated, and the new Victoria rose 200 feet into the air. It seemed to hesitate at first and went spinning around like a top, but at last a brisk current caught it, and it advanced over the lake and was soon borne away at a speed of 20 miles per hour. The doctor continued to keep at a height of from 200 to 500 feet. Kennedy frequently discharged his rifle, and when passing over islands, the aeronauts approached them even imprudently, scrutinizing the thickets, the bushes, the underbrush. In fine, every spot where a mass of shade or jutting rock could have afforded a retreat to their companion. And they swooped down close to the long pirogues that navigated the lake. And the wild fishermen, terrified at the sight of the balloon, would plunge into the water and regain their islands with every symptom of undisguised affright. 
We can see nothing, said Kennedy after two hours of search. Let us wait a little longer, Dick, and not lose heart. We cannot be far away from the scene of our accident. By eleven o'clock, the balloon had gone ninety miles, and then fell in with a new current, which, blowing almost at right angles to the other, drove them eastward about sixty miles. It then floated over a very large and populous island, which the doctor took to be Farum, on which the capital of the Bidomais is situated. Ferguson expected at every moment to see Joe spring up out of some thicket, flying for his life and calling for help. Were he free, they could pick him up without trouble. Were he a prisoner, they could rescue him by repeating the maneuver they had practiced to save the missionary. And he would soon be with his friends again. But nothing was seen. Not a sound was heard. The case seemed desperate. About half past two o'clock, the Victoria hove in sight of Tangalia, a village situated on the eastern shore of Lake Chad, where it marks the extreme point attained by Denham at the period of his exploration. The doctor became uneasy at this persistent setting of the wind in that direction, for he felt that he was being thrown back to the eastward, toward the center of Africa, and the interminable deserts of that region. "'We must absolutely come to a halt,' said he, "'and even a light.' For Joe's sake, particularly, we ought to get back to the lake. But to begin with, let us endeavor to find an opposite current. During more than an hour, he searched at different altitudes. The balloon always came back toward the mainland. But at length, at the height of a thousand feet, a very violent breeze swept them to the northwestward. It was out of the question that Joe should have been detained on one of the islands of the lake, for in such a case, he would certainly have found means to make his presence there known. Perhaps he had been dragged to the mainland. The doctor was reasoning thus to himself, when he again came in sight of the northern shore of Lake Chad. As for supposing that Joe had been drowned, that was not to be believed for a moment. One horrible thought glanced across the minds of both Kennedy and the doctor. Came and swarm in these waters. But neither one nor the other had the courage to distinctly communicate this impression. However, it came up to them so forcibly that at last the doctor said, without further preface, Crocodiles are found only on the shores of these islands or of the lake, and Joe will have skill enough to avoid them. Besides, they are not very dangerous, and the Africans bathe with impunity and quite fearless of their attacks. Kennedy made no reply. He preferred keeping quiet to discussing this terrible possibility. The doctor made out the town of Lari about five o'clock in the evening. The inhabitants were at work gathering in their cotton crop in front of their huts, constructed of woven reeds, and standing in the midst of clean and neatly kept enclosures. This collection of about fifty habitations occupied a slight depression of the soil in a valley extending between two low mountains. The force of the wind carried the doctor further onward than he wanted to go. But it changed a second time, and bore him back exactly to his starting point, on the sort of enclosed island where he had passed the preceding night. The anchor, instead of catching the branches of the tree, took hold in the masses of reeds mixed with the thick mud of the marshes, which offered considerable resistance. The doctor had much difficulty in restraining the balloon, but at length the wind died away with the setting in of nightfall and the two friends kept watch together in an almost desperate state of mind. Chapter 34 At three o'clock in the morning, the wind was raging. It beat down with such violence that the Victoria could not stay near the ground without danger. It was thrown almost flat over upon its side, and the reeds chafed the silk so roughly that it seemed as though they would tear it. "'We must be off, Dick,' said the doctor. "'We cannot remain in this situation. "'But, doctor, what of Joe? "'I am not likely to abandon him. "'No, indeed. "'And should the hurricane carry me a thousand miles to the northward, "'I will return. "'But here we are endangering the safety of all.' "'Must we go without him?' asked the Scot, "'with an accent of profound grief.' And do you think then, rejoined Ferguson, that my heart does not bleed like your own? Am I not merely obeying an imperious necessity? I am entirely at your orders, replied the hunter. 
Let us start. But their departure was surrounded with unusual difficulty. The anchor, which had caught very deeply, resisted all their efforts to disengage it, while the balloon, drawing in the opposite direction, increased its tension. Kennedy could not get it free. Besides, in his present position, the maneuver had become a very perilous one, for the Victoria threatened to break away before he should be able to get into the car again. The doctor, unwilling to run such a risk, made his friend get into his place and resigned himself to the alternative of cutting the anchor rope. The Victoria made one bound of 300 feet into the air and took her route directly northward. Ferguson had no other choice than to scud before the storm. He folded his arms and soon became absorbed in his own melancholy reflections. After a few moments of profound silence, he turned to Kennedy, who sat there no less taciturn. We have, perhaps, been tempting Providence, said he. It does not belong to a man to undertake such a journey. And a sigh of grief escaped him as he spoke. It is but a few days, replied the sportsman, since we were congratulating ourselves upon having escaped so many dangers. All three of us were shaking hands. Poor Joe, kindly and excellent disposition, brave and candid heart, dazzled for a moment by his sudden discovery of wealth, he willingly sacrificed his treasures, and now he is far from us, and the wind is carrying us still farther away with resistless speed. Come, doctor, admitting that he may have found refuge among the lake tribes, can he not do as the travelers who visited them before us did? Like Denham, like Barth? Both of those men got back to their own country. Ah, my dear Dick, Joe doesn't know one word of the language. He is alone, and without resources. The travelers of whom you speak did not attempt to go forward without sending many presents in advance of them to the chiefs, and surrounded by an escort armed and trained for these expeditions. Yet they could not avoid sufferings of the worst description. What then can you expect the fate of our companion to be? It is horrible to think of, and this is one of the worst calamities that has ever been my lot to endure. But we'll come back again, Doctor. Come back, Dick? Yes, if we have to abandon the balloon. If we should be forced to return to Lake Chad on foot and put ourselves in communication with the Sultan of Bornu. The Arabs cannot have retained a disagreeable remembrance of the first Europeans. I will follow you, doctor, replied the hunter with emphasis. You may count upon me. We would rather give up the idea of prosecuting this journey than not return. Joe forgot himself for our sake. We will sacrifice ourselves for his. This resolve revived some hope in the hearts of these two men. They felt strong in the same inspiration. Ferguson forthwith set everything at work to get into a contrary current that might bring him back again to Lake Chad. But this was impracticable at the moment, and even to alight was out of the question on ground completely bare of trees, and with such a hurricane blowing. The Victoria thus passed over the country of the Tibus, crossed the Belad de Gerard, a desert of briars that forms the border of the Sudan and advanced into the desert of sand streaked with the long tracks of the many caravans that pass and repass there. The last line of vegetation was speedily lost in the dim southern horizon, not far from the principal oasis in this part of Africa, whose fifty wells are shaded by magnificent trees. But it was impossible to stop. An Arab encampment, tents of striped stuff, some camels, stretching out their viper-like heads and necks along the sand, gave life to this solitude. But the Victoria sped by like a shooting star, and in this way traversed a distance of sixty miles in three hours, without Ferguson being able to check or guide her course. "'We cannot halt! We cannot alight!' said the doctor. "'Not a tree! Not an inequality of the ground!' Are we then to be driven clear across Sahara? Surely, heaven is indeed against us. 
He was uttering these words with a sort of despairing rage, when suddenly he saw the desert sands rising aloft in the midst of a dense cloud of dust, and go whirling through the air impelled by opposing currents. Amid this tornado, an entire caravan, disorganized, broken, and overthrown, was disappearing beneath an avalanche of sand. The camels, flung pell-mell together, were uttering dull and pitiful groans. Cries and howls of despair were heard issuing from that dusty and stifling cloud. And from time to time, a party-colored garment cut the chaos of the scene with its vivid hues, and the moaning and shrieking sounded over all, a terrible accompaniment to this spectacle of destruction. Ere long, the sand had accumulated in compact masses, and there, where so recently stretched a level plain as far as the eye could see, rose now a ridgy line of hillocks, still moving from beneath, the vast tomb of an entire caravan. The doctor and Kennedy, pallid with emotion, sat transfixed by this fearful spectacle. They could no longer manage their balloon, which went whirling round and round in contending currents, and refused to obey the different dilations of the gas. Caught in these eddies of the atmosphere, it spun about with a rapidity that made their heads reel, while the car oscillated and swung to and fro violently at the same time. The instruments suspended under the awning clattered together as though they would be dashed to pieces. The pipes of the spiral bent to and fro, threatening to break at every instant, and the water tanks jostled and jarred with tremendous din. Although but two feet apart, our aeronauts could not hear each other speak, but with firmly clenched hands they clung convulsively to the cordage and endeavored to steady themselves against the fury of the tempest. Kennedy, with his hair blown wildly about his face, looked on without speaking. But the doctor had regained all his daring in the midst of this deadly peril, and not a sign of his emotion was betrayed in his countenance, even when, after a last violent twirl, the Victoria stopped suddenly in the midst of a most unlooked-for calm. The north wind had abruptly got the upper hand, and now drove her back with equal rapidity over the route she had traversed in the morning. "'Whither are we going now?' cried Kennedy. "'Let us leave that to Providence, my dear Dick. I was wrong in doubting it. It knows better than we, and here we are, returning to places that we had expected never to see again.' The surface of the country, which had looked so flat and level when they were coming, now seemed tossed and uneven, like the ocean billows after a storm. A long succession of hillocks that had scarcely settled to their places yet indented the desert. The wind blew furiously, and the balloon fairly flew through the atmosphere. The direction taken by our aeronauts differed somewhat from that of the morning, and thus, about nine o'clock, instead of finding themselves again near the borders of Lake Chad, they saw the desert still stretching away before them. Kennedy remarked the circumstance. It matters little, replied the doctor. The important part is to return southward. We shall come across the towns of Borno, Woody, and Kuka, and I should not hesitate to halt there. If you are satisfied, I am content, replied the Scot. But heaven grant that we may not be reduced across the desert as those unfortunate Arabs had to do. What we saw was frightful. It often happens, Dick. These trips across the desert are far more perilous than those across the ocean. The desert has all the dangers of the sea, including the risk of being swallowed up, and added thereto are inendurable fatigues and privations. I think the wind shows symptoms of moderating. The sand dust is less dense. The undulations of the surface are diminishing, and the sky is growing clearer. So much the better. We must now reconnoiter attentively with our glasses, and take care not to omit a single point. I will look out for that, Doctor, and not a tree shall be seen without my informing you of it. And, suiting the action of the word, Kennedy took his station, spyglass in hand, at the forward part of the car.